Lord, thank you for the word of God that is sharp, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Open the scriptures and help us today. Lord, we need help so badly in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 32. You got your Bible? Hold your Bible up. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Take good notes today. We're talking about reconciliation. Say that, please. Reconciliation or war. That's what's going on. That's your choices, and we want to opt for reconciliation all that we can. Now, I want to tell you a quick story. Uh, I, you may not know this, I was a tremendous athlete as a younger man. I was one of the greatest mediocre athletes South Carolina ever produced. I could do a lot of things average to poor. I was really gifted. But when I was in the eighth grade, I went out for my high school wrestling team, and I made it as an eighth grader. And uh, I think it was because of my unusual physical prowess, because I was animal quick, extremely powerful, killer at heart. My coach saw that as a 13-year-old. And not only was I such an amazing specimen at 13, I was six feet tall, and I weighed a stout 121 pounds. (laughs) It was massive. If I turned sideways, you could not see me except for my big nose. And that is not actually my picture because I wasn't that muscular. Uh, I was kind of like a praying mantis or a cross between that and a zipper. If I turned sideways with my tongue out, I looked like a zipper. And so uh, we were a small school in South Carolina, small town, 500 kids in the school, 120 in my class. It was the very first year of the program. I remember they bought the mat, they bought the equipment. And my coach came over to me and said, Mr. Pearson, you are a scrapper. Everyone say scrapper. And I recognize that about you. So I thought I was a guy on the right. I was more the guy on the left, okay? And uh, he says, we don't actually have enough boys to adequately fulfill all the 14 weight classes or whatever there, they, there were at the time. So therefore, I've made a decision about you. I should have been smart enough to know this was not going to be good, no matter what he said. So I'm going to allow you the privilege of wrestling three weight classes bigger than you are. You'll be in the 150 to 165 pound weight class. What do I know? I'm an idiot. And so, but the next two years of my wrestling career, I had, honestly, this is the truth, I had a perfect record. I lost every single match I was in. My teammates used to take bets on how quick I would get pinned. It's bad when your teammates are laughing as soon as you go out on the mat, you know? And so each week, this is what happened to me on a routine basis. I got trashed every single match. I got blitzed. Everyone say blitzed. I got blitzed every single match. I got absolutely smoked. That's not in the Bible, but that's what happened to me every single time. Uh, What's the moral of the story? I'll tell you in just a minute. Uh, The main thing is I kept my perfect record, and I'm proud of that. (laughs) And we're going to read about a wrestling match. And your pastor and God wants you to be successful, victorious, and win. But there's one wrestling match you ought to always lose. Always lose that one. Matter of fact, lose it every time. When you get called into that ring, just hold your hand up, fall on your knees, roll on your back, and say, okay, Pen me, please. Now, let's talk about conflicts. Has anybody in this room ever had conflicts with people? Hold your hand. I'm not sure if there's anybody here, family, friends, neighbors, classmates, workers. So, 
We're going to see some huge conflicts in the scripture. And I'm glad the scripture doesn't pull punches. It tells you like it is. So I want to ask you in the midst of a conflict, is, is the conflict about you being right? Do you think you have to be right about everything or anything? Is a conflict about your pride? By the way, pride will get your teeth kicked in. There's nothing good about pride in the eyes of God. Or, well, you don't know how I was offended. Okay. I've been offended. I get a chance to get offended every single week. You probably too. We all get offended. Or how about this one? Well, they won't listen to what I think. Well, is what you think really that important? Maybe. Maybe it's not in the light of eternity. But sometimes the relationship is more important than what you think. Or how about this one? Well, you don't know how bad this made me look, Steve. You don't know how embarrassed. You don't know how this really ran me over what my son did to me or what my boss did to me. Or you don't know what I've lost. Well, hey, we've all lost things. And part of life is going through loss and getting back on your feet, okay? Now, the issue is, well, what is the issue, Steve? The issue is, what are you willing to do to bring healing in the midst of that conflict? Do you like conflict to go on and on and on? Because there's two things that will keep you from healing the conflict. Now, in one way, we can't control how other people respond. Paul said in Romans, as much as possible, be at peace with other people. So I'm going to do all I can on my end, but then it's up to them. But I need to make sure most of the time we don't do all we can because there's two things that holds us back. One is pride because we get hurt and we won't humble ourselves or we won't look at how other people feel about things. And the other one is fear. I don't know if fear is not more, is not more devastating than pride because what happens is stuff goes on and we don't get involved mainly because we're afraid of having the conversation or we don't know how to have the conversation or we're just thinking this thing's going to get worse so therefore I'm going to act like it didn't happen. I'm going to act like it's not there. Well, things don't get better when you do that. Now, one of the things I'm just I'm, I'm saying because I want to give another side to this, I'm not asking you to ever compromise your values. Okay. I'm not asking you to admit to wrong that you didn't do. I can always admit to hurting someone, but I'm not going to admit to things that's not true. I'm not going to do that. And I'm not asking you to acquiesce or look the other way with wickedness. That's, that's not wise. Okay. What are you asking me to do? Well, the, the principles that we'll see in the story today, I want you to consider them. I want you to see how God led Jacob to start a process of healing and ultimately let God's Holy Spirit guide you. He is the teacher. He knows everything. He knows who, what, where, when, and how, and he will give you a strategy if you listen to him. Now, a couple other coaching tip, tips, okay? It's my understanding that the most mature one, the one that is closest to Jesus, the one that loves God the most, has the, the responsibility to build the bridge. And sometimes you think people around you that have hurt you, that are not Christians, that they understand kindness, grace, forgiveness, People who aren't Christians don't get that at all. So why are you expecting them to behave in a certain way? They're not. And even believers, they don't, many believers don't understand what you understand. Therefore, it's my responsibility and your responsibility to attempt to build the bridge and bring reconciliation. I like peace in my home. I like peace in my church. I like peace in my neighborhood. How many enjoy peace? Hold your hand up. I like that. By the way, if you notice, we are not a fighting church. We're not an arguing church. 
We don't backbite. We haven't hardly seen any of that for 26 years because of some of these principles. And when you have as many people as we have, it's kind of crazy. Sometimes I wonder that we don't all just go out in the parking lot and have a fist fight and pull everybody's hair out and gouge eyes. Let's have a Sunday. I gouge in Sunday. No, let's don't. I might have frozen something. Did I do something, Chris? Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, what Matthew 5 says this. Blessed are the, say it with me, please. Blessed are the what? Peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Never are you more like God than when you're helping people build bridges, especially for people that don't know Christ, okay? Now, so my question is, do you want to take the role as a bridge builder or do you want to be known as a bridge burner? I don't want to burn bridges unless it's evil and wickedness. Now, one other point before we go to the passage. You know, on the seas, there's a general rule about ships and shipping. That when there's two ships or more in a harbor and it's very congested and it's a dangerous situation, it is always the responsibility of the more maneuverable ship to adjust. Does that make sense? And it's a great spiritual lesson too. Now, One of the reasons that people don't want to sit down, have the talk, pray through, come up with a plan, and address things is because it's simply no fun. It is just not fun. And, uh, but regardless, it's very, very important that you and I do this. Okay, now that is not the sermon, that's the pre sermon, okay? It's a joke. Genesis 32, let's start reading. Verse 1. Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. And Jacob said when he saw them, wow, this is God's camp. And he named the site Manhanim. Now why did these angels appear? It's only two verses. You read this and you go, well, that doesn't mean anything. Oh, yes, it's very important. You see, in chapter 31, Jacob had just got through a really, really, really difficult 20-year deal with his father-in-law. It was horrible, but now it's behind him, but he's facing now a more deadly, difficult deal because he's got to deal with his twin brother. And the last time he heard his twin brother say anything, it was this, when my dad dies, and my mother dies, I'm going to cut that guy's throat. That's a serious offense. Serious offense. So, God allowed the invisible security team to manifest to encourage him that God was on his side and God was, was going to protect him. By the way, did you know You've had the ministry of angels probably this week helping you. Do you know we probably have in this very room supernatural, invisible warriors in this room with us today, even now? Because the scripture says they minister to the heirs of salvation. Now, this place where he camped is called Manhanin, and this is the exact location. In Jordan, along this river, is where Jacob and his family spent the night before. And it's where the story starts. Now, this, look at this a minute. The name Mananim means double camp in Hebrew. Double camp, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means. It means this. Jacob understood as he and his family camped there beside that river, the Jabbok River, that somebody else camped with him. 
And I don't know about you, there's a, minute, there's a thing called theology of place, which means God enjoys certain places more than others. Places of memories, places of life change, places of surrender that are very, very dear to him. That's where he likes to camp out. I pray when we dedicated the house we live in that he likes to camp out at our house. I pray when people dedicated 1301 Brandon Road that God's presence habitates here, that he loves this place because he has a plan and we want him here. By the way, the most important person in this room is not me and not you. It's him. And we do everything for him. Now, Jacob is in a dangerous spot. Again, because of his own selfishness, his own lack of integrity have come back to bite him. And now he's going to face what he's done in the past because he has cheated his father, cheated his brother. He has broken the heart of his mother who will probably never, ever see again because he's cheated his brother not once but twice. And by the way, if you cheat your family... If you lie to your family, if you steal from your family, and unfortunately, people with little character do that. Don't you ever do that. Don't you ever do that. You treat your family with respect, your siblings, your mom and dad, your parents. Now, This kind of offense doesn't get over quickly. People say, well, all things heal with time. Oh, no, they don't. By the way, how long has it been since Jacob has cheated his brother? Does anybody know? You know your Bible? It's been 20 years. It has been 20 years. And these kind of wounds, just like cancer, they don't get better. They get worse unless you deal with him. Now, let's read in verse number 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded his messengers, say, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I've been sent to tell my Lord, because I'm asking for favor in your sight. Now, let me tell you what, that overture was rebuffed, I think. Because there's 400 armed, angry men on Harley Davidson's and they're on their way north to deal with this brother. So, and I just want you to think like Jacob is thinking, if this thing turns to war, how's this going to play out? Do you think Jacob's going to win or the one with 400 trained men is going to win? And you need to think through before you cut people off, before you don't try to mend fences, do you really want a war? Is this going to bode well for the next 20 years if you don't get this straightened out? <clears throat> so verse number, verse number 7, we see Jacob's response. See it? Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Now, Distressed is another word for being anxious or having anxiety. Another word for anxiety is what? Do you know? Worry. What do you do when you're anxious? What do you do when you have anxiety? The scripture tells us one thing to do. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So he does what you and I should do. He prays, and he's in a jam. And I'll let you read his prayer, verse 7 through verse 12, but essentially you can break it down to three parts. First one is this. Lord, you're the one that told me to come back. Come back. 
And in my heart, if I know the Lord has spoken to me about, I want you to go, I want you to build, I want you to start this. If I know he spoke, that's all I need to know. I can take it. I know you told me to go home. B, I am unworthy of how you have blessed and prospered me. Everyone say prosper. You know what prosper means? It means that God does things for you you could never do for yourself. He helps you move ahead. He provides for you. He opened doors for you. He, he gives you favor. And he says, I left my home 20 years ago. All I had was a staff. But today I come back with herds, flocks, children. I have been blessed and I'm not worthy. But his bottom line is, I need your help to deliver me. Because this could be very, very bad. Now, he quotes a promise. Lord, you told my grandfather and you told my father that our descendants would be like the sands of the sea. So therefore, I'm trusting your promises. Now, why should we pray the promises back? Do we need to remind God what he said? No, he knows. The issue is I need to remember what he said. And it gave him great comfort. Now he's got a plan. Now, pay attention. Are you ready? So when you pray, do you pay attention to what you pray? Do you write down the answers to your prayers? It will build your faith if you do. So he's just prayed this prayer, and guess what? Now he gets an answer. Now he has a plan of what he should do. So he saves his family, and he's not killed, and there's not a war. Here's what he does. First thing he does, he divides his family, his sheep, his cattle, his servants, and his children into two groups. And it tells you why. He says if Esau attacks one group, he doesn't know how many children I've got. He doesn't know anybody's name. He hasn't seen any of it. So if he wipes one group out, at least half will survive. Pretty smart. And then he does this. He gets groups of servants to take groups of presents, maybe an hour apart, 30 minutes apart, south to meet his angry brother. It's three waves of valuable presents. Now, these may not be valuable to you today, but they were very valuable in Jacob's day. The first one is 200 female goats. That's a lot of money in his time. Then I never, I had never actually looked at what he gave. 20 male goats. 200 female sheep. 200. Think of all the servants it took to even take them south. 20 rams. 30 camels that you could get milk from, which was very valuable in this day and time. And all, all of them had a colt or a little camel with them. 40 cows and 10 bulls. 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These gifts are staggered maybe five or ten miles apart. Now, why did he do this? Have you ever noticed sometimes you can touch people's hearts with an act of kindness? Have you ever noticed that? There's a Bible verse in Romans that says this. If your enemy is hungry, what should you do? Is it poison him? Put some strychnine in his brownies? No, make the hot brownies. Because when you can bless people, when you can show kindness to people, 
when you can serve people, it touches hearts and opens hearts. And you know what's wonderful? An enemy may one day become a friend because of your heart. Then he had carefully worded statements to make peace. Everyone say carefully worded. If you're meeting with people who are angry with you, if it's your son, if it's your neighbor, your boss, how you word things and how you say things is very important. You do not want to speak off the cuff. You want to plan what you're going to say. And he planned what he said. Look at verse number 18. He told the servants that were heading each one of the three groups. When Esau stops my group and says, what are these and who are they from and why are you giving them here? You are to say this, verse 18. All this treasure belongs to your servant, Jacob. It is a present sent to you, my Lord Esau. And behold, Jacob is coming in the rear. He's about 10 miles away. And as each group came, each one of the servants knelt before this angry man and said exactly what Jacob told them to say. After this happened, Nightfall came on this fateful evening. And here's what Jacob also did. He led his wives and his 11 children. How many children did he have? Across this river right there. And all of his remaining servants and the rest of his possessions. By the way, he was a very rich man. That is the Jabbok River. I want to see that river. It's across the Jordan. It flows into the Jordan River. I've probably driven by it, didn't even know it. But here's Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and this is the Jabbok River in Jordan. And where all this happened is right about there. Now, Jacob, point number six, has an encounter with a super being. Look in your Bibles. Verse number 24, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, you're talking about 10 hours. And he saw that he had not prevailed against him. He touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated. Have you ever had a joint dislocated? You ever had your body go this way, your knee go that way? You ever been playing softball, slid into home plate, and your arm went back like this, and it got out of socket? I've had some friends that dislocated their hip. It is horrible. So I think this super being, this angel, thumped him like that and said, I'm done, and Jacob went down. The super being said, let me go, verse 26, for dawn is breaking. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you change me. And then the super being asked him a question. He said to him, what is your name? Now, did the angel, by the way, I think this is the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Did he not know who he was? Oh, wrong guy. What's your name, by the way? He wanted him to admit who he was, and what his heart was like. Now, none of us throughout our entire life can ever get away from the strong arms of the Creator. He loves us. He is crazy about it. He cares about us. And like any good father, anyone that he loves, he will discipline He will take his belt off. He will reprove. He will correct. He will cause things to happen in your life to get your attention if you are not paying attention. And the scripture goes on to say, 
If he does not discipline you, it's a very, very, very bad thing. And I want to ask you, are you wrestling today? What do you mean wrestling? Are you struggling with some things on the inside and outside? And what are they? Are you paying attention what the big issue might be? Well, how would I know what I'm struggling about? Well, what's hard for you right now? What's painful right now? What is discouraging for you right now? Now, now this is the most important thing I'll say today. Most of the time, maybe 90% of the time, when we are struggling and things aren't going well, do you know what the real issue is? The real issue is you and God. It's not you and your wife. It's not you and your boss. It's not you and that crazy neighbor. It's not you and this. It's not, it's not you and your finances. If you just get a better job, you'll make more money. That's normally not the issue. The issue is you and him. Because all of us, all of our life, we have times where he holds his hand out and he bids us to step up and get on the mat, to get in the ring. And anytime he calls you to get in the ring, The quicker you get in the ring, the quicker you get on the mat, the better off you will be. And the quicker you just surrender and say, yes, Lord, pin me now. Put the half Nelson on me now because I surrender. Let me give you some examples from the scriptures. David completely broken over his sin with Bathsheba, and he said in his prayer, In Psalms 51, he said, A broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Now, what is contrite? Contrite means you are very, very sorry for your sorry, sorry heart. And David said something for a long time in that prayer that I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. He said, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. Well, didn't I sin against Bathsheba? Didn't I sin against the guy I murdered, Uriah? Didn't I sin about my other kids? Didn't I sin about the nation where a lot of people died in the civil war that came? Oh, yes, you did sin against them. But ultimately, sin is always against God. It's you and him. Paul, when he was Saul, was knocked on his back by a blinding light by the presence of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus said in this blinding light, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, I don't even know who you are. And then he went on to say, let me ask you an important question, okay? Why are you kicking against the goads? Now, do you know what a goad is? Not a toad, a goad. A goad is an object that you pressure animals to move forward. It can be a staff. It can be something sharp. Why are you resisting my help? Now, if you're getting poked today, if you're getting prodded by a situation today, you may need to look and see whose hand is on the other end of the stick. And he's essentially attempting to He's saying by these goads, these prompts, this pressure, son, daughter, all I want is to get you where you need to be. Please don't fight me because I can make it very difficult for you. How many know what I'm talking about? I know what I'm talking about. Another example. Here is Esther, the Jewish, secret Jewish queen of Persia. When she's confronted, actually, I got this wrong. It's not her uncle. She was raised by her cousin, Mordecai, who raised her like his own daughter. And Mordecai confronted her and said, you know what? You've been placed in a position of authority. And if you don't act, when all the Jews in the empire are going to be killed on one day, if you don't act, 
If you don't stand up, if you don't speak up, even if it costs your life, let me tell you what will happen. Deliverance will come from the, for the Jews because God keeps his promises. But let me tell you, sister, what's going to happen to you and me. Your family will perish. So will you stand up? Will you speak? Or will you not? Now, Jacob surrendered to the Lord that day. And when you feel pressure, the sooner you surrender, the less pressure you and I will have. Because what is the Holy One looking after? He's looking after the purity of our heart. Purity comes before promotion. God cannot use Jacob as the lying manipulator that he's been. So he has to have an encounter. God has to deal with him and deal with me even severely at times. Because before he can use us at every single level, just because God has dealt with you once doesn't mean he's not going to deal with you repeatedly. He will over your lifetime. Now, here's a passage. Would you say it with me, please? Every branch that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes it, takes it away, and puts it in the burn pile. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Why? That it may bear more fruit. And that pruning is usually painful, uncomfortable, difficult. So are you being pruned today? Is this a season of pruning for you? Hebrews says, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Don't run away. Don't get off the mat. Don't act like he's not speaking to you. Quickly respond because heart change always comes before a name change. Now here we have Jacob. Jacob means essentially cheater, manipulator, the guy that cuts corners, supplanter, the one who reaches where he shouldn't reach. That's what the name Jacob means. And if Jacob is going to have a new destiny and his family is going to have a new destiny, Jacob has to have a heart change. And he gets it that night in the darkness beside the river Jabbok because Israel means I got called into the ring. I stepped through the ropes. I got a pounding. It hurt like crazy, but I surrendered. That's what Israel means. And today, some of you need to surrender. Put both hands up and say, Lord, I am in. Because if you shortchange, if you don't get in the mat, don't get in the ring, you will end up shortchanging your future all because you won't deal with God. So, stay in the ring. Lose the match. Every single time when he says, come here, son, come here, daughter, run. Don't be afraid of him. Be afraid if you don't go. Let him help you. Let, don't kick against the goads. Let him help you. Now, see this location? This is the location where the wrestling match happened. This is still the same river. This is where he got his breakthrough. This is the biblical site of Peniel. What, what do you mean, Peniel? Peniel is Hebrew for I encountered God tonight. That's what Peniel means. I met God and I surrendered. And your pastor's greatest need on almost a daily basis, I need, I attempted to do it this morning before I saw you. Lord, I want to be in your presence. I want to worship you. I want to surrender one more time. I want to ask for your help. Lord, I can't do what needs to be done. This Jabbok River 
The next morning at sunrise, when the super being, I believe, the Lord Jesus left, he vanished. Jacob got up out of the dirt. I do not know how with, I don't know if the hip went back in socket, but the scripture says when he crossed that river, he limped like, I believe, crazy. And I don't know this. The scripture implies it, but I don't know if it's true. He may have limped the rest of his life because of this encounter. Because it's been said, have you ever heard this? Never trust a man without a limp. Have you heard that? Hold your hand up. Do you know what that means? Worship team, come on up. It means this. To encounter God, well, he strips you of all self-sufficiency. That's a person you can trust. That's a person that's valuable because there's no pretension there. You've been stripped of it. And often, okay, here's ready. This is not in your notes, but the stripping process is always painful. It is always hard. The greatest things that have happened to me have been the most painful. And even when I was a senior in high school and I blew my knee out in football camp, my body went this way and my leg went that way and I'm rolling in that Carolina steamy August humid weather hoping somebody would shoot me. I didn't realize somebody had thumped me that day because he was trying to get my attention because he did not have my attention. And yeah, I had knee surgery a couple of times, but it wasn't my knee that needed repairing. It was my heart. My heart needed repairing. I just didn't know it. Now write this in the margin somewhere. This will help somebody. Only Jesus can give you the right perspective on pain and suffering. Only Jesus. And the hardest things can become the most wonderful things because they become scars of gratitude that God changed you on the inside to do it. And this is the craziest thing. I've read this for years. I had no idea what this last two verses meant. It just seemed so crazy. I had no idea what it meant. So apparently Jacob's family remembered this event. It's not in the Mosaic Law. It's nowhere else in Scripture. But the family remembered it for several generations because Dad had a life-changing encounter with God. And it changed his family. And dad walked a little funny the rest of his life. And so therefore, every time we had a barbecue, we would never eat the meat from that hind quarter. We probably held it up and worshiped that God saved our family that night beside that river. Now, whatever God is saying to you, say yes to him. Surrender quickly. Let him help you. Lord Jesus, release tenderness now. Release obedience now. Release a yielding in Jesus' name. Now the next two songs is the most important part of the service because you get to sit and think. You get to sit and listen to the voice of God. You get to write down what he would say. You can stand and worship. You can come and kneel and surrender yourself today. But respond in Jesus' name.